God we worship is a God of resurrection. Sometimes good things have to die before they can be born, be born again. And uh, for me this morning, the moment when our band was reborn was when Hezeba started playing that beautiful saxophone solo. We thank God for the old band. We let it go. And he's rising up, raising it up anew again on a new platform. We're so grateful to you, Andrew, and your lovely team who are leading us in worship. Every uh, month now, the first Sunday of the month, when we've been celebrating communion with one another, I've been trying to break open the sacrament of communion in, with a fresh angle each time. Do you remember? And this is going to roll for quite a time. So that every time, my hope is that when you come forward to the, the altar rail to receive the bread and wine in remembrance of Jesus' death for us all, we come with a little bit more insight, a little bit more understanding, so we go deeper and deeper and deeper into this precious gift that Jesus has given us to do this in remembrance of him. And when we do this in remembrance of him, his death, resurrection, uh, comes alive for us in a fresh way. So we were looking, uh, the first time we, we looked at this, about the way in which communion yeah, is simply a meal. Simply a meal during which uh, barriers that separate people are broken down. Though we are many, says Paul to the Corinthian church, though we are many, we are one because we all eat of one bread. Yeah? So in a divided and fragmented and fragmenting world, when we come to receive the bread and wine together, it's an outward sign of our determination to be in unity with one another. Uh, quite often, uh, the way in which people on this planet divide themselves up against each other is by who they're willing to eat with and who they're not willing to eat with. Yeah, Always been the same way. And so when we come together intentionally forward and kneel, stand beside a person of a different cultural background, different community, whatever, uh, uh, then we're making a big statement. We're making a statement that we're determined to live in unity with each other and eat with each other as we did on Tuesday evening here in this space, learning how to build a multicultural congregation. Yeah? Fantastic even with, evening with David Halford. It had sacramental significance, yeah? all eating together. We can never take this for granted. We have to continue to work intentionally at it. So communion is about eating together and building bridges to each other and to heaven as we do so. Then, last time we broke this open, we look at, looked at the symbolism of communion. Do you remember from John, that chapter 6, that wonderful chapter, when Jesus basically explains to his disciples something they hadn't got at all, that there's two kinds of bread. There's bread that you need to keep alive, and you eat it, and it goes into your body and keeps you alive till you get hungry again, yeah? Then there's another kind of bread Jesus spoke about, which is a bread that when, which meets not your physical hunger, but your spiritual hunger for God. And when you eat of this bread, you're eating of Jesus. And he comes and lives in you, not just for a day or a night, he comes and lives in you for all eternity. So in eating the bread, you're embracing your eternity in him. It took them a long time to get this, the disciples. Remember the occasion, for example, when the disciples were together with Jesus in the town of Sichar, John chapter 4. Remember the story of the woman at the well? And there's a point in that story when the disciples come to Jesus and say, why haven't you eaten anything? We've had our lunch pack. Why aren't you anything? You're going to collapse if you don't eat anything. And Jesus says, I have bread that you know nothing of. He was feeding on his Father in heaven. That's the symbolism of this. So today, I want to look at specifically 
the Old Testament roots of the Last Supper, the Old Testament roots of what we call communion or the Lord's Supper. Okay. So if you take your Bibles, if you've got one, and turn to chapter 12 in the book of Exodus. Okay, it's about page 67. 26. Chapter 12 in the book of Exodus, about page 67 in the Pew Bible. There's this marvelous moment. This is the whole explanation of the Passover, but there's this mar marvelous moment when it says in verse 26 of chapter 12, And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord. That's wonderful. Because here we have the children saying, look, what are you up to, mum and dad? What are you doing here? What does this all mean? Why are you having this special ceremony um, which you're calling the Passover? What does it actually mean? Yeah? It matters what this means. It's not just something we do. It has a profound meaning. And the children spotted how important this was to ask the question, what does it mean? So then it goes on. When the children ask them this question, then tell them, verse 27, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. An act of deliverance. The Passover meal is a meal they celebrate to remember how of old God rescued them from slavery in Egypt and brought them into the promised land. So the Passover meal is a reenacting, a remembering of that historic event. Okay. So, more than a nosh up, more than just a family meal getting down together. Uh, and having, lighting a candle and having a nice time. All of that, but much more. Remembrance of God's mighty act of liberation. So, some other things on this. Chapter 12 of the book of Exodus, it lays it all out for us. Verse 11 now. Can you find that? Here, we are told, Jews are told, how to eat. This is how you are to eat it. This is how you are to eat the Passover meal. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So they're not just settling down to have a nice family meal every time they do this, though that's part of it. They're actually getting ready to go on a journey. Every time you do this, dress up as though you're going on a journey. Yeah? So this meal, this Passover meal, is about pilgrimage. It's about movement. It's not just about filling your stomach. It's about going on a journey into God's promises as they unfold into the future. Do you see? Pilgrimage, journey, movement. Get ready. I'm taking you on a journey. Okay. Now, chapter 12, verses 14 and 15. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat this bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses, for whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day until the seventh must be cut off from Israel. That's pretty heavy duty, isn't it? What's wrong with, what's wrong with Hovis with yeast in it for my children at breakfast? What's going on here? Is this just some weird, obscure Jewish teaching of old that has absolutely nothing to say to us now? No. There's a profound message in this. Why did God say to them they had to get rid of all the yeast and make unleavened bread? Because 
the yeast, so in the whole Bible, signifies rebellion and sin. And as Paul explains later in Corinthians, a little bit of yeast goes through the whole dough very quickly. Jesus tells that as well in a parable, doesn't he? So the yeast symbolizes sin and rebellion against God. And so they have to get out of the house all the yeast from every last corner because that symbolizes the purification of their hearts before they go on the journey. They've got to get right with God before they're ready to eat this meal and go on his journey into the future he's prepared for them. Yeah? Really important. Okay. Verse 16, the next verse, chapter 12. On the first day, hold a sac sacred assembly and another one of the seven on the seventh day. Do no work at all on these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. A whole week of doing nothing else except getting this meal ready. Well, what's all that about? Holy days. It's a holiday. It's a holy day. It's a week set aside, not just a half-term holiday, right? This is a holy week in which they will prepare to celebrate the Passover meal before they go on the journey, or continue on the journey. This is a profound entering to the Sabbath rest of the Lord. Pre prevent them getting, you know, becoming workaholics and just going on and on and on day after day at, at, at their work. They have to stop. And only in stopping do they lay hold of what God did for them of old in rescuing them from slavery in Egypt. Rest. Now, chapter 12, verses 21 and 20 to 23. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and set, select animals for your families for, and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on, top of the, on the top and the sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway, and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Another weird, ancient Hebrew practice? Or something of abiding significance and importance to us now? Blood being shed. Blood of a lamb being shed, placed over the lintels of the doorway, as protection. The blood is protection for the Hebrew people. Remember the whole story, how it unfolds. And that night, they are protected from the destroyer who comes and destroys the Egyptians that night so that the people of God may actually be set free, go on their journey into the promised land. Blood protection. Now, verse 47 Verse 47 of chapter 12. This is a command. The whole community of Israel must celebrate it. And then uh, if you look at verse 43, second half of verse 43, no foreigner is to eat of it. At this point, in the narrative of the Bible, this Passover meal is an exclusive meal. If you're not a Jew, or, or you're a, not a Gentile who's been circumcised, right? you're not allowed to receive this meal, to eat this meal. What's going on here? Ethnic exclusivity? What is going on? Well, we haven't got time to completely unpack that now, but in a nutshell, I'd say, 
in order to bring the good news of Jesus Christ for all people, God had to start with one particular tribe and bring his message through to them. I want you to be holy because I'm a holy God. And I want your holiness ultimately to spread to the ends of the earth. But we've got to start with you first. Get you holy on the right track. No sin, no yeast. The blood is going to protect you. Yeah, but you're on a journey. You're on a journey towards passing the blessing that you are receiving now onto all nations of earth. We are the inheritors of, inheritors of that. Okay, right. Now, going on to the New Testament. Here's the Passover meal. I've just unfolded it a little bit for you. Yeah? This is the meal that Jesus was celebrating with his disciples in the upper room. That very thing I've just told you all about. That's what he was doing. And in the middle of it, he does something really radical and unexpected, as we shall see. So the Passover meal is being celebrated. I want you to fly ahead in your imaginations to that moment when the Gentiles, all the non-Jewish people on earth, me and you, pretty much all of us here since this morning, are grafted into Israel as a branch might be grafted into a tree, using Paul's imagery there. And then the outward sign is that we all eat together of the, of the meal, the Passover meal. And coming back to Tuesday evening again, we had this wonderful gathering together. We all ate together. And uh, Betty's chili stew from Africa was absolutely amazing. I'll go on eating it forever. An amazing dish that she had there. And when we eat together in the Alpha course, yeah, when we eat the, uh, the meal at the Alpha course together, that's also a sign that we're together, willing to sit at the table with each other and share the food together. Okay. Now, just to pick up how some of these, this symbolism as an Old Testament Passover meal cashes out in the New Testament, okay? So have a look now at 1 Corinthians 5, 7, if you fancy looking it up. Don't worry if you don't want to look it up. Just let it wash over you. This is a really important verse where Paul is explaining to the Gentiles what this Passover meal, this Lord's Supper, is all about. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. So he says in the first half of this verse, get rid of the old yeast. Yeah, same symbolism. Writing to Gentiles here. Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread, leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In those two verses, Paul captures the whole meaning of the Passover meal, of what we call communion. Yeah. Getting rid of the sin, repentance, getting rid of that yeast that corrupts and pollutes, yeah, and celebrating the Passover meal without any malice or wickedness in our hearts, with only sincerity and truth. That sincerity and truth symbolized by the unleavened bread we're eating together. Okay? So, repentance. Now, the blood of the lamb that the Jews of old sacrificed at the Passover. What's that for us? That is the lamb of God, who is Jesus, who died on the cross shedding his blood that our sins might be forgiven and that we might be covered by his blood and thus protected from evil. The Lamb of God. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. 
It's one of the most ancient prayers in the Christian church. I was brought up as a little Roman Catholic boy, and whenever we had the Mass, there would be women behind me and before me beating their chest, saying, Agnus Dei, qui tollis peccata mundi, dono nobis pacem. The Lamb's blood shed for them that peace might come in their lives, in their families. Lamb of God, who takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Don't look it up, but in Revelation 5, 9, this imagery is picked up. This is the vision of God's completed process of salvation. Hear all the saints before the throne of God, kneeling before the Lamb and singing together a new song, you, Jesus, you, Lamb of God, are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God. Now get this bit. You, with your blood, purchased for God members of every tribe and language and people and nation. So the blood of the Lamb of old in the Old Testament times was specifically for the Jewish people, but now the blood of the Lamb of Jesus, the Lamb of God is being shed and recognized to have been shed for every single person that's ever lived on earth. Every tribe, language, nation, people, everyone is included in this. Do you see? You have made them into be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on earth. The completion of the imagery there. Now, I just want to come back to the Passover meal as the Jews celebrated it as a movement out of slavery where they've been in in captive to Pharaoh for 400 years, a movement out of slavery and onto a journey, a pilgrimage through the wilderness and onto the promised land flowing with milk and honey. Every time they celebrate this Passover meal, they remember God's mighty acts of old, his saving deeds. Okay? So every time we celebrate Holy Communion, we are celebrating a God who is a liberator God, who sets his people free from whatever might be holding them captive. For the Jewish people of old, it was physical captivity in and slavery in Egypt. But this cashes out. If at the heart of God is a desire to liberate and set people free, this cashes out for everybody in any kind of captivity. Individually, it may be the person who's captive to alcohol. It may be the person who's captive to, to betting. It may be the person who's captive to sex. It may be the person who is captive to money and the allure of money and getting richer and richer. And God, if he's a liberator God, as we celebrate in the Passover and the communion meal, if this is the the heart of God to set people free, he will set people free from any kind of captivity from which they individually have fallen, fallen prey. Whatever it is, workaholics, God longs to set them free. Lazy old so-and-sos. God longs to set them free and get them working. Any kind of captivity. That's individual. Now, what about collective captivity? Because these people of old, these Jewish people were captive in Israel, uh, uh, sorry, in, in Egypt. They were a whole tribe. A whole tribe. So God is also in the business of setting free any groups of people who are collectively captive. Do you see? This is so important we understand this. So I think of slaves in our own colonial history. We have a terrible, desperate legacy, we white people, of enslaving the black people and thinking it was even the will of God that we might do that. How horrific was that? God has set them free, almost, and set us free from the desire to dominate and hold people captive. 
part of the liberating act of God, part of what we celebrate when we reenact the Passover meal here. Acts of liberation. Any kind of totalitarian regime, whether it be right-wing fascist or left-wing communist, whatever, any kind of abuse of power, one strong group <laughs> over another group, God is in the business of setting those people free. Bobby and Anna lived in Romania, which was held captive to Ceausescu's regime, a horrendous regime, really. But that regime ultimately fell in 1989, and the people beginning to try to lay hold of what freedom means takes a long time. Any kind of captivity... The Syrian people now, what is going on there? What we celebrate here is the victory of God over, over any kind of attempt to hold people in bondage to anything other than God himself. What about, what about women? In our generation, women have still been held back from fulfilling their potential, and still are held back from fulfilling their potential. We've come a long way in my generation in this country, but there's much more to be done. And in many cultures of this world, women are totally suppressed by a patriarchy that has been around since ever. Just because men happen to have bigger, stronger bodies than most women, they're able to do that. But no. Look at Jesus' ministry. His ministry was at every point about setting people free. That's why he took women and honored them. He would have got into hell of a t trouble for doing that. Partly why he was crucified was because he did that. He drew out prostitutes and, um, uh, and lepers and people who'd been corrupted by the abuse of money, or whatever. And he longed to set them free, individually, but also collectively. Do you see? So when we come up here and have our communion, it is a very great deal more than me making my communion to God in a kind of vertical way. It cashes out to the person either side of me, to the people in this church, to the people in Bushmead and Luton, to the whole world, it is of universal significance. Yeah? And that, the vision, the ultimate goal of all of this, we're on this journey towards this, we're pilgrims towards this, our, our belt is tucked, you know, cloak is tucked in our belt, and we've got our sandals on and everything. We're on this journey, and we're on this journey together, we're not there yet, towards the point when everyone together, all nations, tribes, language groups on earth, will eat together in memory of the Lamb of God who is willing to lay down his life, shed his blood on the cross that this might, be, might happen. That's the future. We celebrate this meal. We look back to our Old Testament roots and heritage, but we look on to God's ultimate fulfillment when his kingdom will have been fulfilled and he will be all in all. Good news, isn't it, really? Okay, next time, more stuff, next in the month's time, more stuff on communion. Good, that'll do for this morning. For this morning. For this morning. For this morning.